Hi, Sherry. Hi. I thought a good place to start about talking about what you do. And then if you people don't know, you do re-recording, which is maybe you can explain it better than I can. Re-recording mixer is we do the final sound for television or films. In other words, everything comes to us on the dubbing stage, edited and ready for us to import into our Pro Tools templates. And then we put it all together while we're watching picture using time code. And everybody works a little bit differently because it's Pro Tools. There's no proper way to do it. Some people do it all at once together. You know, some teams, usually it's an effects mixer and a dialogue mixer. Some teams do it rolling along like in the old style analog way when everybody is to go scene by scene together and they play. Some people, I've done it a number of different ways. Um, I kind of look at it as Pro Tools gives me the option of making it one big pre-dub for myself, um, which is the beauty of it. We can both work simultaneously. Sometimes I've worked with a partner who works simultaneously through the same speakers as me. So we just have to clue in the client and get them used to the fact that when they're hearing a car going through a living room, it's not really where we are. He's there and I'm somewhere else working on dialogue. And if you're going to work like that, you usually have to be working with somebody that you're really, you're a good team because like my old mixer used to, he'd hear me start to notch something or work in specifics on something and he would immediately just stop. Or every once in a while, he would turn to me and go, isn't it about time you went out and had a coffee or a cigarette? And I'd go, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, you need some time. And uh, the, my effects mixer that I'm working with now, Scott Weber, he stays on headphones. And usually the first day from around 10 in the morning, 9 in the morning until about 4 in the afternoon, we're working completely independently, separately. He's on headphones, working with small picture I'm working on, using the big screen with picture. And then at some point we say, let's do a play down together. So it's, there are very different methods, but it's all to the same ends, which is coming out with a full soundtrack for the, uh, for the TV program or the mu- or the film. So in a kind of average day, if you think about where you sit when you're doing your work, what's around you, sitting in front of a desk or a computer, is there outboard gear around? Okay. All of the above. Um, if, During a normal course of the day, I walk into a studio. It can be many different sizes. Um, The screen is way up front, anywhere from a few feet to 10, 15, 20 feet, whatever, depending on the room I'm in. Um, Normally, I'm behind an icon of some sort, console, an Avid Pro, Pro Tools console. And I've got usually two two computer monitors in front of me directly between us. There's another full set of pro tools and computer monitor and, um, uh, yeah, computer monitor and screen and all that. And then to the right of me is my partner who has his full set of pro tools and his console. And all these consoles are independent of each other. There's three systems, um, going at the same time. And he's got two screens in front of him. Usually on one screen, we've got the edit screen or the mix window. And on the other screen is what we use for our plugins. And then the console is right in front of us. So we're looking at a lot of things. In fact, um, a lot of times I don't even look at the big screen except for when I'm going through something and checking what, where I'm at for that particular scene. Otherwise, I'm, my, my head is down and on the console and I'm glancing up. But I'm looking at that edit screen like it's my god. I'm sure it varies session by session, but how many channels are you normally working with? My effects mixer could be using hundreds. Um, for me, in dialogue, because I've got dialogue, I've got ADR, I've got group walla. Uh, which is the humana humana, you know, the background talking or call outs and police radios and things like that. And then I've got my music. My music stems will come at me normally for most TV shows will come at me in stereos, groups of stereos. And that could be 20 tracks, 24 tracks. And then there'll be some independent tracks, which 
are songs that might be played more along the lines of the score, and then there'll be what we call futz tracks. And those futz tracks are the process tracks, the pra- you know, the bar source or the elevator source, and you'd be processing them in a certain way. Sometimes they'll merge, they'll go between tracks, you know, it'll start out full and then it'll cross into a car or it'll cross into a restaurant or something like that. So aside from the score, I'm dealing with all these other parts. How many tracks varies? I mean, it depends on how big a show is because there also might be shows where I'm dealing with 5.1 tracks, uh, sound design tracks um, for special effects and things like that that are more dialogue driven, monster, some monster sounds that might also be mixed with the effects, the special effects sounds. So it could be, it could be hundreds. <laughs> you just, you kind of get used to it. I try, I'm, I'm somebody who likes to whittle my tracks down. Some people like to just stack things and stack things and go through it. I'm very organized in the way that I ask my sessions to be consolidated. And I, and at the beginning of this session, I consolidate things because at least I know where they are to keep it, more viewable and closer to the uh, access on the console. So I'm not switching to all the lower levels, although that's a norm because you're, you may, you know, you're, you might be on a console that's 24 or 32 channels wide, but you've got layers and layers of additional tracks underneath. And with Pro Tools and especially a Pro Tools console, you get to access those just by the push of a button once you've set them all up. So again, there's no, no, you know, people go, well, what's the right way to do this? And I go, there is no right way. That's the beauty of it. I mean, back in the old analog days, you were stuck with 32 channels or 24 or whatever you had in front of you. Um, And it wasn't until I think the Harrison series 10 or 12 that they gave you an A and a B side where you could sort of have two layers, but you were pretty much stuck with what you had. These days you can go layers and layers and layers down and have a couple of hundred tracks that you have access to. Plus you have VCAs that you can put on top, um, faders that can control many things at once. Um, It just depends on how you set it up and what your comfort zone is. In terms of processing, like compression and EQ, how transferable were your skills from recording going into this field? Very and very in terms of the very basics of it all, because compression is compression, equalization is equalization, reverbs are reverbs. Um, I'd say the biggest difference in this mode is that when I started in records, I was dealing with black boxes. You know, you turn around and you patch things in and then you'd work the little boxes and things. Plus, you'd also have faders that, you know, most of your special effects were on black boxes. You had EQ and sometimes compression on the faders, depending on the console and different times during when I've been through a number of different consoles. Some just had basic equalization and the rest was outboard. So having plugins available, the sky's the limit. But the knowledge, the basic knowledge of how to use these devices hasn't really changed at all. In in reality, you know, you're still dealing with you're still dealing with the same basic concepts. It's just a different manner. And also the amount that you have available is far more in plugins than in analog when we were in our analog days and we were kind of stuck with what was in front of us and whatever we could get to patching wise. I mean I remember days when I was working at Sony and we had a, uh, well, we went from, I think it was a Spectrus, we went from an older version console, I think it was a Spectrosonics to a Harrison Series 12, which was major. I mean, that was like a big change for us and it had automation, et cetera. But I still needed a notch filter. So I had two universal audio, you know, notch filters behind me. So I had to go behind me, turn around, patch them in, and then utilize them. And when I turned back, sometimes I'd hear other frequencies that I didn't hear when I had turned around because nodes and frequencies appear in different areas of the room sometimes. 
So there were times where my effects mixer or my music mixer might say, because at that time we had three mixers on stage. Now it's only two. But they would say, do, do you hear that? Do you hear that high frequency? And I'd go, no. And I'd move around in my area and I couldn't hear it. But then I'd go over to where he was sitting and I'd go, oh, yeah, thanks. Hang on a second. And I'd you know, reach my hands out and do it that way. So having everything right in front of you is that was a fantastic boom, although it was a major change. I mean, and I, I describe this scenario, and it sounds very, very weird, but it's really true. When I first studied Pro Tools or learned about Pro Tools and was still working in the analog realm on the, the Harrison console, which was, you know, had some digital in it, you know, it was a digi- It was considered a digital console, but it's not like what we have today. I had taken a class, and I learned all kinds of cool things. And then I had to sit down to my first session. And at the same time, I was still working at Sony with black boxes, you know, a lot of big boxes. And I remember the feeling to me was, in the heat of the moment, I'm staring at these screens at a big screen, I'm running this session and it's as if somebody put me in a spaceship and said, there's the moon. You've been there a million times. You know all everything you have to do to get there. Now, all your controls are now on the ceiling. Turn around and face the back of the spaceship. Reach your hands up and get yourself there. Because I had the knowledge, but the ergonomics, the muscle memory, thinking in regions and not track sheets. It was a completely different psychological way of approaching things. And at that very moment, it was like dive in and do it. And thank goodness I had a great sound supervisor who was an old Pro Tools geek from the beginning. And he just kind of, oh, you're doing it that, why don't you try this way? It's faster. And I'm like, oh, I know how to do that. You just don't know exactly when to do that. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was a very different world, but you can transfer all the knowledge, just like I can transfer when I went from being a musician into being a record engineer, all that knowledge came with me and was utilized because it's all my ears. And then the same thing from record engineering into post-production It's transference. And my music background still came through to me really nicely in that other realm. And I was, I've been very lucky to go through all these phases and have three kind of redefining career changes, but they all relate. How does your use of compression in post production compare to when you were recording engineer or mixer? Um. It's, it's different because I'm dealing with dialogue expressly. Um, I rarely compress any of the score. I rarely compress any of the music unless it's the futz track and I'm trying to control dynamics uh, so that it doesn't get in the way of the dialogue. Because with my score, I have stems that I can lower or raise the offending channels so that I don't have to lower the overall score. When you're dealing with a source cue, you're stuck with a two track. So I might really crunch, you know, and I can't say this number or that number three to two, you know, whatever the ratio is, because it all, I just play with it until I get what I want, the desired effect. And quite honestly, these days with certain plugins, I don't even need to really compress. I can just go in and kind of move certain thing in it. Like, move the offending voice or instrument a little bit lower in those sections. Um, uh, Same thing with my dialogue tracks. Um, What we have over here is called the LKFS, um, which is the meter that we have to keep our dialogue levels at, the overall dialogue levels at. And some some networks want it just to be uh, measured on the dialogue. Some want the entire acts to be measured or the entire show to be measured. So normally at the beginning of the session, I'll run about the first two or three minutes and I'll get my overall setting. But rarely am I going to change 
my basic compression level. I'm not a heavy compressor. I like to give things as natural a flow as possible. And I don't want the compressor to do the work for me. I'd rather do it with the faders. I've heard a lot, you know, it, it depends on your approach again. You know, same thing with equalization. You equalize when you need to equalize, you don't have to equalize everything. You know, but you do want to get your design, what's in your mind's ear. And that's how I put it. It's it's what what I know I'm hearing. It's just like when I start playing those two or three minutes, it's amazing that I usually settle into the exact number we need. And when I don't, I, I usually say, let's pink the room. My partner and I are both very tuned into that. I think we're a DB or two off because I'm pushing my levels in and I'm not getting the right numbers here. And it doesn't make sense because I'm not – I'm not comfortable with what I'm seeing. My faders are up too high or, or something. And normally we're pretty right. We're pretty right on. You get very used to hearing a certain level and you can go into any room and you know what that level is. And then you just glance over to the LKFS, you know, meter and you go, Oh yeah, I'm there. And that's, I think years and years, that's not the case with it, with everybody, you know, all the time. But I've been doing this for so many years that I've just gotten used to a certain level and way to do things. Do you have any favorite compressors for dialogue? And are there certain things in different voices that make you choose different ones? Uh, I've been using a, a Waves um, plugin for quite some time. And, and one of the reasons I've stuck with that is because it, um, it's everywhere. Um, because I've moved around so much and I don't want to have to buy every plugin on the planet, I buy the specialty plugins. Otherwise, I stick with what's there. Like, I still use the EQ3. Um, uh, it's a great equalizer and it, it's everywhere. Um, I'll use um, uh, the Avid Pro Limiter. I love that one. Um, I use that on my stems, my outputs. But I pretty much stay pretty standard on a lot of my bass. I don't have a lot of plugins on each channel. I have an EQ. I have an EQ on each channel. And then I have a dialogue stem and an ADR stem. So on my ADR stem and dialogue stems, I have a Cedar. I have a Q10, which is um, in bypass until I need it. Um, I have my de which right now I'm using the S2 and, uh, and I'll use a compressor. And then on my, the output stage of my, my final dialogue, uh, out, there's an Abbott Pro limiter. I, I stay, I, I really don't like to put tons of crap on everything. I don't, I don't necessarily feel I need a compressor on every channel. I have faders. And I can, I have clip gain. And I work very intensely with those. I'm not sure how much recording you still do, but are there any skills that you kind of developed in post-production that you then brought back to recording and it changed the way you approached it? I'm not doing uh, record engineering. I stopped doing that quite some time ago. Um, I've been in this business a really long time, longer than you would believe. And there was a certain point where the record industry in the eight in the early eighties kind of dropped the bottom dropped out of the record industry. It was right around the time that Napster was getting going and everybody said this was going to happen and that was going to happen. And a lot of it did happen. I mean, a lot of record companies went down, um, some survived, but it took, started taking on a different, different light. Um, an engineer I had worked with, was working at a studio called Metro Media Studios at the time. And he called me up and he said, hey, I gotta go on summer vacation, but um, I need somebody to come take over my gig. And I said, okay. And he said, you know all the gear and you've got great ears, so how would you like to take over for the summer? And I said, sure. He goes, you know all the, all the equipment, you just need to learn about CMX. And I went, what is a CMX? He goes, well, that's the synchronizer we use. It's actually more used a lot. It was more used for picture, but they had it set up so that it was used for synchronization. And these, this was kind of 
just when QLock and VTX Soft Touch and some of the older synchronizers were starting to be used. So I went over there and started doing the show Three's Company and started working in post-production. Um, the truth is I, I took a job there afterwards, but the minute I had an album, I would go running. Because those were in the days of, it was just getting stereo. I mean, it was boring. To me, it was like, what am I doing here? Why am I wasting my time? Music is where it's at. That's what my love is. And it wasn't until I started getting further into it and doing some other jobs that I started seeing the benefits of getting further into the field. So I never really went back. After, I tell you, around 85, I stopped doing record engineering. I have definitely consulted on friends projects. I've def I always re rely on my ears and, you know, uh, like my partner, he's a musician and many times he'll send me something and I'll go, you know, honey, I think you need to DS this. That's my, always my big takeaway is you need to DS this. That's going to splatter because it drives me crazy. I'm, I'm very sensitive to it. Um, I'm like, send me the tracks and he'll be like, but I am DSing her. I'm like, you're not doing it in the right place. Let me work with you on it. And I'll show him something. So a lot of times I'll, I'll work with him on some of his tracks or friends of mine if they ask them, but I'm not really recording anymore, nor am I mixing anything major. You know, it's for me, the world of post-production really started getting interesting um, in the late 80s and 90s. And then we, when we went to uh, LTRT and 5.1, a whole world opened up. And then now you're in Atmos and 7. Point, I mean, the world has opened up and it's become a lot more fun to work on. You, you, you really get to be creative. People, some people go, oh, so you're just, you're very technical. I'm like, the technical part of it doesn't enter into it as much as, in, except for knowing how to use the gear, as much as your ears and your creativity and what you see, you know, and what you, what you, tr what you're given and what you end up with. Because sometimes you're given a lot of bad dialogue and you just have to make it sound wonderful. And that's where the challenge comes into that. Plus creating atmosphere and, and working with a partner to achieve the vision of the director or the producer or whoever. Could you talk a little bit about your career path that started off as a musician and then going into record engineering? <laughs> it's a long one. <laughs> um, well, I started out in New York City. I grew up in New York. And I was a, a kid with a guitar. I was a musician. Um, back in the mid sixty in the in the mid sixties, there was a place called uh, folk, the Folklore Center, which was in Greenwich Village. And anybody that was anybody in folk music pretty much passed through there. I mean, Bob Dylan, Joni Mitchell, Phil Oaks. I mean, Joan Baez. Everybody. That was the place to be. And I was taking blues finger picking style guitar right next door. When I was a kid, my parents used to have Sundays are your day. And so they would say to my sister and I, where do you want to go for your Sunday? And my mother would say, oh, I want to go for a drive in New York State in the country. My father would want to stay home and watch a game. My sister wanted to go do this, whatever it was. And I always said, I want to go to Greenwich Village and hear the music. So from my very young age, I would do that. And um, I took my music lessons there. I also took some lessons at Manus College of Music. And then I was gigging around town. You know, I was gigging and wherever I could. But I was sort of the cute kid that came in from New Jersey and played a mean guitar. Um, they found me my first guitar. Uh, it's like an Epiphone Epiphone. And I still have that to this day. I just can't part with it, even though I don't pick it up enough. Um, when I went to get the guitar, they had called me in New Jersey and said, hey, we've got the guitar for you because I was using a classical style, you know, nylon string guitar to try to play blues finger picking style, which was trying at best. So they said, we have the perfect guitar for you. So I, they said, can you get a hundred dollars? I was, I was 13 or 14 at the time when the guitar came in and I'm like, yeah, dad. So of course he loaned me the hundred dollars. I went into New York the next day when I went in, 
is he said to me, hey, your guitar is being played by that young girl over there in the corner. So I went over and I sat down and listened. And she was playing. She was just singing a little bit. She's just beautiful, beautiful voice and stuff. And she said, she turned to me and she said, oh, you must be the girl that's come to fetch this guitar. And I said, yeah. And she said, it's perfect. It's a great little guitar, a great sounding guitar. It's the perfect size for you because it was a Martin D18 size body. It was a small body. And it just she said, the neck is like butter. You're going to love it because it was a steel string guitar. And I was like so excited. And I said, thank you. And she said, here, let me hand it to you. And I said, thank you. She goes, I said, hi, I'm Sherry. She goes, hi, I'm Joan. Oh, it was Joni Mitchell before she was Joni Mitchell. I didn't realize that until probably a year or two later. But um, I remember Izzy saying to me, um, you know the girl who's playing your guitar? And I said, yeah. He goes, Listen for her. She's going to be special. I mean, you know, those were the kind of things that happened. You know, you had the Cafe Juan, the village gate, and you had, you know, you had all these wonderful places in the, in the village where all this music was being done, and I got to experience it. And luckily, it was at a time where these people were like, you know, my protectorates. You know, they, they were like people that, that really minded for me, looked after me. Um, you know, we go on like the march to the UN when Martin Luther King spoke and all that. Yeah, I have a dream. All that stuff I was there for, which was amazing. So anyway, from there, um, I would play gigs. Like I said, in town, I had fake ABC cards, which were cards that said that I was older than I was, that I was 18 when I was really like 16 and such. And around that time, my parents took a place down in uh, the Jersey Shore. And so... I was playing at a coffee house down there, 30th Street Station, I believe it was called. And I got to know the people. And after the two weeks, my parents said, uh, okay, we're going back home. And I said, oh, please, please, you know, let me stay down here with these people. They're wonderful and they'll look after me and I'll stay with this girl and, and, uh, and I can keep playing music. And I said, come on, you raised me, right? This is, you know, let me do this. And they said, okay. And then about a week later, these signs started going up for this big music festival that was going to be held in upper New York State. And I remember the night, the day that we put the sign on the coffee house that said, closed, gone to Woodstock. So we drove to Woodstock and I spent five, I know it was a three day event, but I spent five days there. I stayed to help clean up afterwards, but I saw everybody and everything. And that sort of solidified, like this was my world that I needed to be in. This was, this was the life I wanted. You know, I was going to be a, a musician and I, all I wanted to do was get out of high school and go study in college. So that's what I did. Uh, after high school, I got accepted into a couple of different places to study music. I got an, I applied to every progressive school in the country and got into Goddard, Goddard and Antioch. But both of them had issues I didn't want to deal with. So I went to this little, at the time, it was a little school called Webster College, which is now Webster University. And had it looked like a good music department. It was a classical music, music department. Very classical. After six months of Gregorian chant at 9 a.m., I realized this wasn't really what I signed up for in my head. And one of the guys there said, well, there's this great jazz school in Boston. You should come with. You should. I'm going to apply. Why don't you? I said, OK. So I got all the applications and went over to Berkeley uh, the next semester. Actually, between that time, I took my backpack and hitchhiked across the country and uh, and then went to Berkeley College of Music. And that was my dream. I loved it. I, I studied arranging composition there. Um, I switched my major from guitar to piano because I felt for arranging composition, I needed to do that. And everything was great for the first two years. And then, I mean, I have very, I have very good, I don't even know if I still do, but I think so. But I, I had relative pitch, you know, I have relative pitch. I have it enough so that if somebody gives me tonic, I could analyze anything, you know, sitting in a subway and just write it all out. What started happening to me was there were some amazing musicians around me. They were wonderful and they seemed to do it so effortlessly. And for me, I felt like I was working too hard. 
and I was reaching these walls. I was handing in these great charts and great papers and I was getting A's and I was doing everything right, but I wasn't creating anything. I couldn't create anything. Everything to me, I could write it out. I could analyze it. It was a sub five of a two five of a, it all related back to the, the classical and such. It just, I wasn't feeling fulfilled. I felt like I was a better composer beforehand. When I look back at who I am today and what I do, it all makes sense. But back then, I would get through, I, I, I would, it was almost like I was using mathematical formulas to, to calculate everything and do everything, but I wasn't able to create from it anymore. Now, considering that I barely passed math in grade school, um, it was, I didn't, I didn't make the connection as to why I would be good at it this way. Of course, you realize later that if it had been taught to me in a way that made sense, you know, as soon as I needed it for music theory, it came right to me. But I couldn't do it. So I remember sitting in a class and, and telling a friend of mine next to me that if, if I got an A on this next paper that I was handing in, I was quitting. I was going to go do something else. And of course, I got an A minus and I went to the dean and I quit the next day. And some of my teachers were a bit upset with me. They, you know, they, they felt that that was the wrong thing for me to do, but I explained all the reasons why I needed to. One of them got me an appointment to a really amazing, a, a wonderful man that taught at Boston University, Hugo Norton, to study, strangely enough, classical counterpoint and fugue. And, but the way that he taught it was a very different way. He was very well known for his teaching style and the way he looked at things, which was not just musically and mathematically. It had a whole philosophy behind it. And that did help break me out in a lot of ways. Berkeley also had a two track studio downstairs run by a guy named Joe Hostetter. And I used to go down there. I had to do a project, I think in one of my semesters and that's what first made me aware and fascinated me on, on the world of sound. So I quit Berkeley and a lot of things happened, cutting to the chase. I got a job at a recording studio um, in a small town outside of Boston. Uh, I wasn't a secretary because I never, one of my teachers at Berkeley told me never learn to type. They'll put you at the front desk and you're too talented for that. So I never learned to type. So I didn't have a job typing, but I was sort of his representative, the guy who owned the place and I was his assistant. And at the same time, I was hanging out upstairs with the engineer, just kind of learning and picking up what I could. There was a school called Orson Welles Film School that had an A-track studio downstairs, and I took the class for it. And the people that I actually took the class with ended up putting together Berkeley College's College of Music's major facility eventually. Um, when I went to Berkeley, like I said, it was... Well, another funny thing, um, Berkeley had 50 girls to 800 guys. Uh, in my acceptance letter, it said in the PS at the bottom, Berkeley doesn't have facilities for women, so you might want to check out approved apartment complexes to use. But there just weren't any women. There weren't any women in the school. And the same thing in, in the recording industry. I expressed interest to the boss that I wanted to be an assistant engineer and he was very Italian mafia sort of style, like somebody out of Tony, like Tony Soprano kind of guy. And he just went, no, women don't belong in the studio. And I said, Hmm, that's a drag. Okay. But I kept learning and I took a job, a job at a jazz workshop, Paul's mall, which was the place that everybody came when they came through Boston and I did live sound and I worked with everybody, Muddy Waters, BB King, Herbie Hancock, to Korea, all the greats. It was that was a great experience, and I kept on learning about sound. Um, I also took classes at Boston School of Electronic Music back in the Moog 12 and ARC 2600 days, which fed into all of this. And this was all in like a three-year period after I left Berkeley. Did sound for local bands. Um, just started really getting into it, and then. Um, one night there were, well, first of all, the engineer was teaching me, really teaching me. Um, an incident happened where he couldn't get into the studio because of a big snowstorm. The room was filled with musicians. He called and told 
Joe, the boss, that I should start the session, which pretty much floored Joe, but he had no choice and he let me get it going. Bobby came in after an hour and sat down and said, yeah, great, he did it. So I got the assistant engineer job there. Um, boss said, okay, you got the job. I'm going to pay you half the money you made before. And if you screw up, you're out. He didn't actually say screw up. He said another word, but, um, and I don't know, can I say that stuff? But, uh, <laughs> but they gave me the job and Bobby continued to teach me. And then one night we were doing some wiring after hours and these two guys from another st uh, in the business in town came over and we're helping and we were laying down getting very stoned at about two in the morning and they said, so, <coughs> so you really want to be an engineer? And I said, yes. And Bobby's been teaching me and I've done this, this, and this. And then, well, we're, we're building a studio. You want to come with us? And I went, they said, you could be an engineer. And I went, okay, okay, yeah. And I said, do you mean it? And I called them the next day and said, do you really mean this? And they said, yes. So after a month or two, I turned in my notice and I went with them. And we took a trip out to California and looked at studios, came back to Boston, realized that we didn't have the money that mean, many studios had. So we were going to have to wing it a little bit. So, you know, brought, you know, built the studio. A lot of stories on that one. A lot of stories. Um, started out with a board that looked, had rotary pan pots, little metal sliders, spring reverb that was underneath the console, and we to cut decay times, we use pieces of fiberglass and move them around. Um, we didn't have a digital delay, so we used our basement with a Neumann and bidirectional. We did crazy things. We built a counter with a bicycle chain on our 16 track. That was some of the best experiences to learn from the inside out. You know, I was the smallest one, so we built a shell within a shell that sank in the first six months. I was up in the rafters doing most of the wiring because I could fit because I was small. So I was up in the fiberglass and the ceiling doing it. Um, after a couple of years of that, I decided I wanted to move to the West Coast because I loved it when I had been out there with them. And I felt I could go only as far as, as that as I did in Boston. So it was either New York, which I knew like the back of my hand, or Los Angeles. And I decided I wanted an adventure. So I was going to Los Angeles. So I drove out to LA. Didn't, I, I did know, you know one person and stayed with him for a couple of months. And every day we'd come into, the, into town and uh, look for a job. I wanted an assistant engineer's job. So Larrabee Studios was the one that happened first. And at the that time, they were one of the biggest studios in town. At the same time, a client of mine from Boston called me and said, um, hey, uh, we have to do a demo. We got signed by Capitol, and um, we'd like to do three or four songs. Do you have a place that you can do it? We got about $3,000. So this was 1976. And I was like, yeah, let me check. And Jackie Mills, who was the owner from, from uh, Larrabee, had uh, been calling me a lot and talking to me and a few other studios, but I kind of got a good groove feeling from him. So I went to him and I said, listen, I've got $3,000. Can I do this band? And he said, yeah, you know, I'll give you one of our engineers to assist you. I'm like, okay, let's do it. Needless to say, at the end of that, I got my keys, my hat, my cap, and my T-shirt. And I had a job at Larrabee Studios as an assistant engineer, which eventually in turn brought me into engineering and um a lot of years of working with some remarkable, remarkable engineers and people and producers. Um, and I learned so much, a great deal. I, I was, it was also a time of disco when disco was happening and a lot of the composers and producers wanted, you know, they had these big orchestras and you were punching in and out of multi-track machines. 
And one day, just through talking, one of my, I think my boss told one of them, you know, Sherry Reed scores. And they went, oh, well, we want her. And so they would give me a score and I'd be sitting at the multi-track machine punching in and out these big buttons and they'd circle what they wanted, you know, like from this point to this point, they want just the 16th note run or, or these, you know, this run from this measure to this measure in and then out just on the strings, just on. And so I kind of, that was my musical background coming at me from right there. That was just transferred right over without even a thought. So I kind of elevated myself in a lot of people's eyes. And so I got to work with some of the really strong producers. And, and in time, I even got to work with um, producers that um, gave me credits as an engineer um, and do overdubs and things like that. My big break came when uh, somebody, I don't know if you've heard of him or not, but Kim Fowley. Uh, who found the run? Kim Fowley, who found the Runaways, and founded the Runaways. Yes. Well, Kim, I, I had worked on their Runaways album, and Kim said, "I've got an all girl group, and I want you to do it." And I went, "Okay." So that brought me completely out of the assistant engineering world and into the engineering world because I must have done five or six albums with him afterwards. And. On the Orchids album, I actually got vocal arrangement credit. On a, a couple of things that we did, I got vocal arrangement credit, which I did. I did vocal arrangements for it. Um, and the fact that my pitch was so good helped him in realizing, you know, like, have them do that again, have them do that again, or I'd go, we need another take. So that all happened, and I worked with, you know, like I said, countless people. And then the phone call came from this guy who was going – on, uh, you know, to, that's how I got into post-production going on his summer vacation. But my move from musician to records was sort of like a complete career change and a complete about face because all I ever wanted in life, and I had a plan, was to study music, be a musician, play music for the rest of my life, which it happens, you know, unexpected. I didn't know I'd even have three careers in the industry, which I did. But the music career ended because it was time for me to use that and move into another realm and opportunity presented itself. So that was a long answer to a short question. That was great. <laughs> Can you think of any other weird techniques from that studio that you worked in? The one in Boston? Yeah. Oh, goodness. Well, <sighs> I've, it's funny. I'm, I'm doing sort of another retrospective thing, and I've had to go back and relive it, and I keep saying, why didn't we have iPhones at that time? I've been reaching out to people. There are no pictures anywhere of any of it. Um, I mean, I would, I would say the mere fact that we had, ha we had a set of springs living underneath the console and that was our reverb unit and having to move fiberglass pieces around, that was insanity. That was absolutely crazy. Um, the, the, <laughs> we built our headphone cables. They came out of the ceiling so that they wouldn't be on the floor. So when one of them died, you'd have to go up to the top to repair it. Eventually that all changed. You know, this was a learning experience, building this studio the way that we did, finding out. I remember the night that we realized the shell within the shell sank. We were sitting in the drum room. We were laying around in the drum booth about three o'clock in the morning, very, very stoned, one of my partners and I, and we were listening to, I think, uh, Stevie Wonder, very superstitious, blasting through the studio. And we were saying, look what we've accomplished. Look at what we've done. And this cement truck or something rolled by outside. And we felt like it was an earthquake in our room. And we were just like, what was that? What was that? And he goes, oh, my God. And I'm like, oh, no, we sank. We've coupled. The realization of all the work of trying to build the shell within the shell and realizing that it just coupled with the earth 
that was hard. That was very hard for us to deal with. Um, and then, again, we had a 16-track machine, and there weren't counters or n numerical readouts on these things, on you know, really old machines. And so one of the guys who worked there decided to build a counter, and it was this sort of triangular little thing that had numerical readout, not digital, but, you know, like the kind that goes rotary and little by little comes down. And he used a bicycle chain a lightweight bicycle chain connected to the bottom of whatever in the 16 track machine. So every rotation created movement in the counter. And that, I mean, when it went into high speed rewind or fast forward, I mean, it was like a, a jet engine taking off. It sounded so massively loud. You couldn't believe it. And yet, it worked. I mean, we could actually locate songs. It worked until it didn't. One day, and this wasn't for me, and this was just recently reminded, He, this person recently reminded me, thank goodness for Facebook, the great homogenizer, you can almost reach anybody. And, and one of the engineers told me, he goes, yeah, it worked great until it didn't, remember? And I said, what? And he goes, yeah, part of the chain mechanism broke and I was working on a session. And at the end of the day, they wanted to roll back and listen to the first take, which we realized the counter was no longer working properly and we had gone over. So that was the end of that. I remember the day I came in and said, what's going on with the counter? And they said, we're not using it anymore. It's gone. Um, when we got the first console, when the person that joined us um, came in and we, we got the first real console and was able to do away with, oh, that's the other thing. With the rotary pan pot fader console, we had what we what he used to call peaker dippers. The little gray boxes, you know, metal boxes that you buy in stores to, you know, electronic stores to build things in. Well, we had a series of those boxes with three little click stop and rotary pots next to it so that at set at a couple of frequencies. So those were our high, mid, and low equalization. Those were our EQs. Um, and I remember going, can't I, can I sweep it? I mean, can I, why does it have to be a click stop? And he goes, a next generation will be a sweep, but right now we just got the click stops. And I'd have to patch into it. On the rotary console, we also had little sliders underneath with little black things in the middle that went left or right for our pan pots. And then there was another little small black knob that um, would be our echo sense. And then the echo return would be on another little box to the side. I mean, this was a homemade system. It was clean. It was amazingly clean. But it was so unconventional because consoles were very expensive and consoles were few and far between, quite honestly, at the time. And so, you know, we would we would be patching things all over the place to get anything done. The system that we had for the DDL was one of the best. And I got to say, I learned a tremendous amount from that because having a basement that was cement and having a Neumann, a Neumann microphone and bidirectional counting of uh, uh, bouncing off the walls and catching that bounce and then bringing it upstairs and feeding it back into whatever we needed. That was an amazing education because you'd go down there and you'd move things and you'd be hearing the difference right away. Or you'd send down an assistant and say, okay, move it to the left. Okay. Move it closer this way. Okay. Turn the mic to, you know, and you would be winging it. It would be totally with a wing and a prayer that you'd get anything, but you would get it back up there. And it was cool. Sending a tar signal down there. Those were the kind of things that helped you realize what you had when you started getting into the real equipment and the real gear. Like when I first came up against the equalizers on this new console, it was, wow, I could do anything in the whole wide world. Echo sends, there are two or three. You mean I can have two sets of springs down there or, you know, somewhere else or I could use that to bring up, to send to downstairs and then bring it up. And then little by little, you know, we, we got like DBX noise reduction or we got uh, Dolby's or we got, we got different things that we could start patching in to make it a viable studio 
as time went on. But I keep thinking that from the very beginning, being involved in that studio from the ground up and building it and learning how to do things in the most unconventional way possible, you know, tape delay was tape delay. You know, you set it up on a tape machine. Um, I couldn't have had a better education because the little eight track school that I went to didn't really have much. It was, it was mainly set up for musicians so that somebody, they could record their own stuff. So I, I recorded everybody's stuff cause I was only, I was the only one there that was really interested in learning how to do it as opposed to recording all, my own music. So I learned a good deal from that on how things could be, but I learned so much doing it in unconventional ways, you know, because that was the beginning of what turned into black boxes, really. So, you know, there, there were so many unconventional ways. It was wonderful. And interestingly enough, the first post-production studio that I worked in, in Los Angeles, the first major post-production studio, which had been transitioning from records to post-production was EFX Systems. And every time we walked into a room to set up, we had to wheel in the synchronizer. We had to wheel in all the gear that we needed. It, it was like you had a blank room with a console, but you had to create everything else. So that was also a great education. You know, um, I couldn't do that today. Quite honestly, I couldn't do that today. But then coming up through every little stage was wonderful. And um, also going from analog to digital and post-production, just from those days, in, the late, in the, the late 80s, it was a world of difference. You know, we had, we, we, the, our studio had the first three synclaviers, synclaviers, however you want to pronounce them, um, we had the first three that any studio ever owned in Los Angeles. Before that, we were using emulators and Moogs to create sound effects for cartoons and things like that. Um, before that, you know, in, uh, and, and a lot of people were still using card machines and rolling in from a four track. And if you wanted to uh, phase up, you know, create a movie soundtrack, you would phase up the four track dailies. You'd have the dailies swapped over to four track and then you'd phase them up, put them onto the picture and put them on a multi-track. You know, when I think of the lengths we went to, to build a show to now, it's just so much better now. <laughs> it's so much better now. I think that's all my questions. So thank you so much for speaking with me. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. It's my pleasure.